Have you ever been sitting in linear algebra class wondering what it really means to make a matrix diagonal? Whether we have a purpose on this earth? And how to truly be happy? The last two questions will be left as an exercise for the listener. Today, we'll only be looking at the first one, because there are some special matrices where diagonalization has a really nice geometric interpretation. My name is Jackie. And my name is Alex. And we'll be talking about the spectral theorem. In this video, we will assume that you know the definitions of eigenvalues, eigenvectors, basis vectors, spanning sets, and how to diagonalize a matrix. Consider the following 2x2 two two matrices with real entries. What do all of these matrices have in common? Well, their eigenvectors are at right angles to each other, and on top of that, they're all the same length. These are a special class of matrices, called self-adjoint matrices, which themselves are a special case of normal matrices. These matrices are what the spectral theorem discusses, and we're going to get to what all of this means by first introducing linear operators, moving on to inner product spaces, and then using those to build up to vector projections. Suppose A is a matrix. We know what it means for A to be linear. We can move out addition and scalar multiplication. Now let's consider a linear function T instead of a matrix A. We know that we can write any vector as a linear combination of the basis vectors. Here we call it E1 and E2. Now, can we figure out what our linear function T does to our vector V? Instead, let's say we had a matrix. Here's how this one affects the plane. Now, let's apply our matrix to our basis vectors. We can see that adding the transform basis vectors gives us V after it was transformed by the matrix. On top of that, Note that the columns of the matrix are just the transform basis vectors. Now since T is also linear, to figure out what it does to V, we similarly only need to see what T does to the basis vectors. Furthermore, this process shows us how we could write T as a matrix. We could also go the other way, starting with the matrix, and define a linear function. These special linear functions are called linear operators, and there's an exact correspondence between them and matrices. Recall the traditional dot product of vectors. When the dot product of two of them is zero, we know that there are right angles, and we can figure out how long a vector is by taking the square root of the dot product with itself. We can generalize the concept of the dot product to an inner product. This is a function on a vector space, which is linear in the first component. It's conjugate linear in the second component. And it's non-negative, only giving zero if what you plug in is zero. We can then use the inner product to define a norm, just as we did with the dot product, the square root of a vector inner product with itself. Inner products also let us define orthogonality in arbitrary vector spaces. We say two vectors are orthogonal if their inner product is zero, which just generalizes the concept of right angles. We can also define one of the terms we saw at the beginning, the adjoint. Given a linear operator T, its adjoint key star is the unique linear map so that Tx, inner product with y, is equal to x, inner product with T star y, for all vectors x and y. If we choose to represent our linear operator as a matrix, the adjoint is given by conjugate transposition. We know that not all matrices commute, and we know matrices are just linear operators in disguise, so not all linear operators commute either. If T commutes with its adjoint T star, then we call it normal. If T and T star are the same operator, we say T is self-adjoint. Consider the red unit vector V, where the dashed line is its span. Now draw any other vector U. We can find two vectors, one of which lies on the span of V, the blue vector, and this orange vector that lies in the orthogonal complement, or the set of all vectors that are orthogonal to V. When we add the blue and orange vector together, 
we get u. This is how we define vector projection, because these choices are unique, and so we call the blue vector the projection of u onto v. We can now combine everything we've learned into one big theorem, the spectral theorem. It tells us that if we have a normal operator over a complex vector space, or a self adjoint one, if we have a real vector space, that its eigenvectors form an orthonormal basis for the space. On top of that, we can write the operator as a sum of projections onto these eigenvectors, weighted by their eigenvalues. Okay, but what does this like actually mean? Consider the following real self adjoint matrix, and note that since it's real, this really just means it's symmetric. Its eigenvectors are written in blue, and we know that by the spectral theorem, they form a basis for our space. Can we figure out what our matrix does to our red vector v in terms of what it does to these eigenvectors? Well, yes. If we project v down onto each eigenvector, scale up by the eigenvalue, and then sum up the result, we'll end up getting what the matrix does to v. It's really just a bunch of simple vector projections in disguise. These matrices and linear operators, normal and self-adjoint ones, really are a special class, however. If you just pick a random matrix or a random linear operator, and you do this down, projecting onto its eigenvectors and scaling, you might end up nowhere close to where you're supposed to be. So just be careful. To describe this, <laughs> to describe this thing. <laughs>